and, and a little yeah. bit of shameless self-promotion. This is our 15 year, 15th year, and we've done uh, 300 and some projects. So we get involved with stuff all over, different scales, places. But one of the first projects we had, um, I was real excited. We were started. We were waiting for some grants to come through, and I, I got to do a lecture down in a Virginia at one of these watershed groups on law impact development. And afterwards, and I, I don't hear very well. It's uh, too much listening to Fog Hat in the 70s of the youth. Uh, plus, it's, my kids say, what was it like growing up? And I said, it's kind of like dazed and confused. I was in that movie. It was my life story. I won't tell them which one I was. So um, uh, someone came up to me and said, would you like to come to, this is amazing. Would you like to come to Warsaw? And I was like, wow, I'm going to, I was all psyched up. And I said, well, how do I get there? And um, he goes, well, you get in your car and you drive down 95, about 60 miles. What I didn't realize is that there was a place called Warsaw, Virginia, population about 8,000. Um, and I said, uh, oh, you know, me and my big mouth. And um, uh, I said, well, what kind of issues do you have? It says, well, they built this uh, stormwater pond and it's causing us lots of problems. Uh, people put all their, uh, their uh, shopping carts. It seems all the shopping carts in town end up in here. And then there are snakes, and these snakes come out of the pond and go into the video store. And <laughs> but I went down anyway. <laughs> you know, what the heck? And it's a, not an easy drive from D.C., and I'm like, where I'm in the middle hour. And I did a presentation to the town council, and they said, this is great. Can we put this in our ordinance, all this stuff? And it was actually probably one of the first, if not the first kind of low-impact development mm -hmm. ordinance in the country. We worked with this group called Friends of the Rappahannock. We got a grant and put together some demonstrations. So it was actually, turned out, um, two things. One, it, it was a great project, but also realized most of the things that I ever learned about design, I had to kind of forget because um, they really didn't match up a lot with a lot of the type of works um, that we're kind of doing. So my talk today is about um, projects I've been working on for the last five or six years uh, in and around uh, what's called the port towns uh, near Washington, D.C. Actually, we call them uh, legacy communities, whatever that means. They've been around for a long time, probably since um, the 1900s or so. They were small, um, so actually suburbs, first suburbs around the district. They're small communities, usually a couple of thousand people. Um, and uh, when uh, kind of Washington back in the 60s and 70s as kind of uh, things skipped over, they, they were the inner beltway. So uh, when people left the district, they went over the beltway and moved out to the suburbs. And they more or less just became a pretty run down, uh, not really good shape. Um, and so what happens is these small communities actually rely on the county. Um, it's a, uh, we're not going to, the, the kind of government it is, but uh, they don't always control their stormwater management. But um, there's a lot of really interesting, significant historic uh, and cultural sites that go back to um, this part of the Anacostia watershed, which uh, really, if you just Google it, you'll see all kinds of stuff happened in this watershed, uh, War of 1812, uh, all up and through here. Uh, and they're actually the state is, has a big celebration on the War of 1812, which I think we didn't really do that well in. Um, but it's a big thing. So um, we started working some grants with uh, some of these uh, communities. So the first thing is um, for the students here, uh, you all probably learned how to do this Photoshop stuff and you're all whiz bangs at it. I just want you to know we just finished doing some projects in China. Uh, they do these for about $2 an hour. Um, so don't get too excited. Um, <laughs> it's good, maybe you can go over there. But uh, we all have this kind of vision as designers, I think, on how things can look. And what, I learned uh, through these projects is that uh, there's really a, a much different model, especially established kind of urban um, community. So I look at this, and uh, this is where kind of landscape architecture back. This is a LID uh, um, subdivision up in Rockville near us. And you can see um, the, th the three shrubs and the two trees have moved from next to the house out into the median. Um, but it's still the same three, uh, the same budget. and. Um, uh, I know uh, a lot of people here get all excited, and um, I wonder, maybe this is a round table we'll talk about a little bit, or uh, maybe my exit out of the building really quickly, is that a lot of landscape architects say, plants, I can design it. And uh, I think as Tom all, uh, uh, Lipton uh, can tell you some of his work is that, uh, and, and our work too, is that these are really very different and very unique kind of ecological areas that require a lot of expertise. A lot of understanding of the water and who's installing it, where it's going, and the plants. Um, 
or this, uh, which design now, uh, I, if I, I could offer you one of my 7,000 sticky buns I have, um, can anybody tell me who that artist is in that streetscape? Come on, somebody here has to know. Design, oh. No, no. Okay, Howard Finster. Okay, anybody? Get, so vernacular landscapes, come on, you guys should know. Somebody should know that. So um, when you get into a lot of the inner Beltway communities, there's a really diverse population, and I would love to do a book one day on how people have taken these 20 by 20 or 20 by 30 like brick three-bedroom houses, and a lot of them are owned by contractors. So it's amazing what falls off a construction site and ends up in people's house. Some of the most amazing stonework on houses and uh, brickwork that you'd say, like, how did that end up there in these, and there's these big, huge uh, houses that are built out of these little kind of boxes. So one thing is, um, I'm going to put award-winning. Um, now this, uh, only because I'm really jealous. There's some really incredible designers here. I, I feel really bad because I'm not really that good a designer. I think Tom's probably a better designer than I am. He's probably got more talent, which is pretty low. I have a, I have a pretty low bar, um, but Tom's actually got his own kind of talent. So um, <laughs> we're not going to go there either. So um, and, and actually, what this has got this project, if you just type it on the internet. It's gotten job, it's all kinds of awards that really aren't landscape architecture awards, but like job creation awards, energy awards, uh, sustainability awards, kind of a different realm. But um, what we did is actually um, there was a fundraiser one day, and it was a glass studio, so I'm interested in kind of art stuff. And I went and um, I talked to the mayor of this town, and uh, I kind of knew the area. And this town has about 2,300 people uh, not very good economically, has poor tax base, um, houses declining in value, um, but right next to Washington, D.C., just this great location. So there's this one street that goes really through the middle of the town. And where the town ends and stops, you can't really tell. It's just one bigger manure. So this is the main street. So we said, let's fix this. And we came up with some concepts about how we could do a green street, a low-impact development street. And it ended up as we, we really uh, worked and we, in many traditional ways. You know, you come in and you're the designer and you say, here's our design. We worked the other way and said, what do you want to see? What do you do? Do you walk? Do you want to walk more? Do you, where do you go? What kind of patterns do you use when you walk? Um, what are kind of some of the safety issues? You know, and um, so we worked with them and we came up with this design. We have a permeous, permeable pavement bike lane. We have uh, rain gardens. And it was interesting, like the rain gardens, one strategy is we thought about designing them. And I, I had, at the time, Ann English, who's just one of the best rain design. Uh, she runs, works with Montgomery County, Maryland. She's one of the best rain garden designers in the country. She's phenomenal. And we said, you know, let's let the citizens pick the plants because they'll get really vested in it. And we said, you know, some of these plants are going to die. And they were like, that's okay. You know, and the town was like, oh, we'll put other plants in, but let's try them because we kind of like them. Um, so... We kind of worked with that, and, and we actually ended up getting ERA, era funding for this project. Um, it got all these kind of awards, Congressman Center. People from the UN have looked at this because we used local labor, local talent. We tied energy grants into it. Actually, there were about 10 houses for sale along the street. Their value went up is when it was uh, done. So think of that. Um, so it, it's really worked out kind of really well. But, and then all the other communities around it kind of wanted this. And so we started working with other people. So I says, don't confuse yourself. This is a project um, people were asking. Uh, the Canal Park is a really cool thing. We did a similar project like that at EPA headquarters. Just type in Ariel, A-R-I-E-L, Rios headquarters LID project, where we did a lot of this stuff. But that landscape on the left is really a highly designed, manicured, got people out there all the time making stuff. But this one's a lot different. Um, we just asked people to clean up the cigarette butts, beer cans, and McDonald wrappers, and they're more than glad to walk outside of their house to do that. So they're very different types of rain gardens um, that you should look at. So when we found is that when we, we started working with some different communities, and process and history are, are really important. So um, a good thing, you can go to USDA and get about anywhere in country aerial photos. So this is what that looked like in 1938, this town. This is in 65, and this is in 2010. So if you really looked in close inspection, nothing's happened there in about 50 years except decline in property values and use. And I'll show you some of the reasons why. So we actually bought Tom Lipton out because no one always believes local 
experts, and, and Tom likes to travel, so we got him on a plane to come out back when he was working. Um, and so we started preparing these things. So this is like one exhibit we prepared. And I started looking at it like this. And I said, wow, the graphics are they're nice. You got all this. And I said, let's not use this. Because what we found out is when we put really complex things up, people get really glossy-eyed. So even though the professor might look at it and say, oh, you're, that's a cool arrow and all that, people really want simplistic things. What can we do here? And all you have to do is, uh, and, and this means you have to actually engage people and talk to them and explain to it. Because I think a lot of people, um, once you, our role has been give you the information in a form that you understand it so you can be proactive. So what happened is originally the street here in that Bladensburg project I showed you was going to just be a repaving project. And the town got together with the mayor and they worked, they actually with State Highway and said, we can do this and we want to make it a green street and it ended up being funded as one. So it's kind of neat. When you give people information, it's amazing how much really they know more about their community and their values and what they want to do. So this is the way the street looks on this. Now this is a state highway. This is an urban street. This is maintained. So when people talk about maintaining LID and how hard it is, I mean, this is the basic street. Okay, this is the street maintained as today. Not, not really that good. And um, you can see here, Tom, Tom is sticking his head out into traffic, thinking it would, and I had to pull him back, pull him back. So Tom and I walked here, and we, we just came up with ideas that we present. Or is, that, or is that the time you got really sick? No, that's the, the tall Tom, not the short Tom. So we were walking. But this is a typical 60s kind of design. There's a little um, thing here that p three people park in. Um, and so I was getting Tom, and you know, I am kind of mischievous, and I said, Tom, can you walk down here because I can't fit. <laughs> and Tom, brave, this is a pedestrian access. Um, and this is called the uh, P-Tunnel. This is actually the real access, but no, there's a reason for calling it the P-Tunnel. Um, and no one will actually go down it. Um, but this is just the way that we had our legacy for design. Um, see this building? This building is really important. I'll explain that in a minute. So Tom made it back a lot. So we started working with people and the shop owners, and they said, we would like to have a pedestrian area. We would like to have cafes, just like they have in Georgetown, in the really nice neighborhoods that people, and people walk here all the time. They're going to, not everybody owns a car. You know, they got to go to the bus stop or they got to go to the CVS. Um, you know, and you can see there are a couple businesses here. They're not Starbucks. There's value furniture. There's a local bakery, right? And so they said, we want that. So we just came up with some real simple things, you know, to communicate that. And we said, you know, if we move the parking around the back, they said, you know, you're only losing seven or eight spaces. And they were like, cool, we got like 500 spaces back there. And by having more people on the street, less crime, um, all kinds of other kind of benefits. And we use local products. For example, these blocks are manufactured right down the street, right, and put in by local contractors. So you can't really get much better than that. Now, these aren't an approved BMP in the state until recently, um, which is just awesome to me. But here's an example of a good technology um, that can work, and it's a local product. And what we're going to see, I think, over time is more and more local products, more different products um, that we can look from the business perspective. So now we're on our next kind of phase. We got a grant from Fish and Wildlife Foundation that funds a lot of projects, Tom's, a uh, small, short Tom. I can't really say it's short or tall Tom. I have to figure out a better term. Uh, big Tom, big strong Tom, okay, so without shoes, shoeless Tom. Um, <laughs> I hope you can edit some of this out because this is going to be... So, what we did is um, we're actually doing four um, rain gardens, one for each of these four communities there. And we found out like there was someone who came up with a, a rose hybrid um, there that lived there actually in the 1870s, 1880s, um, a freed slave. And we're going to do a garden there. We're going to do a kind of a sensory garden. We're going to do garden plants of historic Anacostia. So we're making these really nice themed gardens. Um, and signs, and, and we're working with the University of Maryland, actually. Um, we're, as part of the grant, we're going to show, we developed a, a program for high school students for science and math uh, programs on rain gardens that we're going to do, and I think it's one of the kind of first ones in the region that the high school is going to use this as part of their curriculum. 
we'll bring that out to the Bay. And we're using kind of local people and local jobs training. Um, so you can see I always like the signs. You know, we're all always into this wayfinding. This is your traditional 1960 sign. And then you have this. This is actually a very historic site. It's a, a dueling ground. So in Washington, it used to be if you didn't get along politically with someone, you would challenge them to a duel. I'm for bringing that back, maybe. Um, <laughs> maybe with just paintball or something. Less, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we have to get some of those people out of there one way or the other. Um, Okay, so, um, you know, and now you have QR codes and all that, so that's going to be our next kind of generation of signs. But I thought that's kind of interesting um, group of signs. So what um, I think I'd like to get people, wow, the universe, the universe, um, is, a, is a takeaway is that um, it's not really about presentation in many of these communities. It's about really educating them in um, a way that, uh, people can understand in very simple terms. Uh, once, you know, there are people that are very interested in the science. Um, but we've also found out that we're, we're talking about things in terms of, um, you know, we're, we're, right now everybody wants to know the cost and what is the cost of community. And I think, um, and I know Tom's going to talk about costs and how things are cheaper, but I think the cost model, quite frankly, is going to be obsolete pretty soon. I mean, we're working on some projects that are very much different, very different business models. And um, it's really about the financing. In our region, um, we have uh, the combined sores, we have MS for stormwater permits, and I think compliance, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, probably eight hundred million billion dollars is gonna be spent on stormwater. It's a lot of money on the table. And people have to figure out how to pay for that. And you're gonna see private entities public-private partnerships, they're really going to come in and they're going to work with municipalities and rates. It's a very complex thing. I'm not an economist. I have no idea. I just go to the economists and say, what does all this mean? So a lot of the ways in which we are going to, a challenge for us in design is how to create value. That will be our next kind of generation on how to do this. How as designers we understand those basic um, things. So. Thank you yes, very thank much. You're welcome. Thank you. Applause. <laughs> How is uh, low impact LID funded? Are you a non not for profit? We compete for projects uh, a lot of times, um, either through research projects or um, planning design projects. So we look for projects that are a little bit more innovative. So, so it is a for profit. No, it's not yeah. a for-profit. It's still we're still an NGO, but we compete. Like I said, sometimes we get grants, but grants aren't that much out there anymore. Right. Um, the big ones, you know, Penn State gets the big grants now. Um, but uh, we compete. We, we compete like other things, mostly with research organizations. So we work with the uh, Water Environment Research Foundation. We have uh, three or four projects with the National Academy uh, Transportation Research Board on BMPs, watershed planning. Um, and, and is and one of I, your benefits that you know how to strategize and fund projects like this, or yeah, of the type you're of the type, speaking yeah. Of. So, so that's but, but your we value to municipalities. Yeah, that's a value. So we would work with maybe a grant from uh, EPA or a grant from one of the uh, funding organizations. But I did want to mention. I, I kind of forgot. This is where I'm going to get chased out of here. Maybe um, this is a lead. I, I just was really interested when I walked up this building. It's quite beautiful. It's lead certified gold, but it's copper. And talk about values of designers and landscape architects. Beautiful, aesthetic, at all lead points. I just got a project from the Navy, just talking about the diversity of how to use LID to treat copper at DOD installations and metals, because copper is one of the most toxic things to fish imaginable. So here is a sustainable building built out of an incredibly this, is, this would be covered in asphalt or something there, remediated, you know. So we have to, you know, it, our values often in design miss a lot of the ecological and a lot of the environmental things, and we have a tremendous amount to do with it as a profession to get caught up with that. In terms of uh, some of the finance, we were both at a seminar actually last Friday where mm -hmm. Uh, localities through a not-for-profit were selling the naming rights to their high vi vis visibility rain gardens yep. 
and were able to finance an enormous amount of implementation just so that local businesses uh, could do it. But uh, I wanted, particularly with Edmonton and some of the other projects, they weren't just stormwater and they weren't just native plants. Yeah. Could you comment on some of the things like the, the energy savings through the street lamps and some of yeah. the other things that so, make a good green street green? Just quickly, I, I would probably say that we really don't do um, stormwater anymore. And I think a lot of this is the sustainability and uh, um, we're, we're more infrastructure designer. I just think it sounds cooler anyway. Um, because the way to get a lot of this stuff, you know, if you start taking LID and say the cost to install and retrofit, but what we have to realize is, um, you know, I'm a member of AC, everybody talked about the report card, you know, our infrastructure, it, it's 50, you know, we're way beyond the life cycle of any of our stormwater, you know, in, in our infrastructure. Bridge is failing, right? So we have, and especially in areas now in urban areas where we're rebuilding infrastructure, this is our shot for like the next 50 years, because that's, you're going to design stuff, it ain't getting torn up in 10 years. We, you know, we have this really accelerated narrow window where we have to start taking advantage of things. And so, uh, for example, at Edmondson, this was a chance to put in LED lighting, okay? And so they worked with a utility company. They got grants. They actually got grants to, they, they rolled it in to get Energy Star grants to look at the windows, like your leaky house. So the thing is, when people see positive things happen, there's interest, there's economic interest, there's development community interest, there's political interest, you know, senators, congressmen, they all start, yeah, this is my idea. Yeah, okay, let's take it, fine, you know, I, I got it. Um, so they, you know, it brings a lot of other money. So they got money for that. Um, they're actually working, these communities are working like Kaiser Permanente on getting walking. I mean, can you imagine walking down that street with the sidewalks like that? You know, it, you should get a prize without falling over into traffic. So, um, you know, there's a lot of those money comes to the table from those issues, right? And it's a chance, you know, it's, it's interesting. People say, like, like, why don't you replace all the utilities at one time? We have massive water line explosions. We just had a 60-inch water line, like, blow up in the middle of one of the main arterials. You know, why don't you start replacing it? So people are starting to ask, if we're going to start doing these things, let's, you know, start really making sense on how we replace infrastructure. And that's kind of the next generation, too. Thank you. Thank you.